Good evening. I almost want to say happy Sabbath, but it's not happy Sabbath yet. <laughs> Greetings from the General Conference. It's a privilege to be here at the Georgia Cumberland Conference Camp Meeting, and coming here is like coming home for me. I was not born here, I've never lived here, but my parents are here, and so coming here is like visiting, it's not like, it is visiting my parents, and uh, we are, as you can see, we are of the Asian flavor. Please don't ask us if we're North Korean or South Korean. We are Korean. Yeah, we are, I was born in the United States. We come from the North and in New Jersey and the New York area. My parents came down to the Atlanta area about 10 years ago, and they love the South. Amen. They love the weather. They said, my father once said, I love it that you can go into a restaurant and all these people are praying before they eat. People open the door for people and they say, sir and ma'am. My wife is originally from Korea and you know, she came down to the set, we visited the southern area before and she says, what is this, this, this thing that looks like oatmeal but it's not oatmeal? <laughs> ah, it's called grits. What is, is it's not gritty? It's made out of corn. Why do they call it grits? I have no idea, we gotta look it up. Anyway, this is the land of grits and, and of so, uh, sweet tea, and it's home for us, and it's a privilege to be with you all here tonight and this week. Uh, from the General Conference, greetings from the General Conference, a lot of our leadership is in Europe. And just to give you maybe a broader view of Adventism, I've had a great privilege to travel to different places around the world, uh, just to give you a different view of Adventism, one third of all the world Adventists are in Latin America. That's Mexico, the Caribbean, Inter-America, South America. One third about Tish is down there. Another third is in Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa. So you take all of Africa, or Sub-Saharan Africa, Africa and Latin America, that's about 66% of the Adventists of the world. Now you take all of North America, you add all of Europe, and then you throw in Australia in there, just because Australia can do that with Australia. And what percentage do you think we have of the world Adventists in those three areas? It's about 8%. 8%. Just to give you the demographics of, of how the world changes, uh, the world church is changing. And so there is this great need now that the, the part of the church that once sent its missionaries is now slowly becoming the area that needs missionaries once again. Especially, we, we talked with the, the boys up here, I love their presentation, on the Middle East, we have the 1040 window. If you're familiar with the 1040 window, please raise your hand, praise the Lord. There are also other windows. There is the postmodern secular window. There is also the 18 to 35 window, the young people in our church that are missing. And there's also the urban window. And so the General Conference staff, in the month of May, they, they just blitzed Europe. They called it the Christ for Europe. And they just got back like a couple days ago. And all over Europe, they said, hey, evangelism does not work. Hey, we don't do this in Europe. We just sit, and we sit really quietly in our sermons. We don't say amen. We just leave when the sermon's done. We don't come up for altar calls. We don't do, we don't do evangelism. That's rude here in Europe. And the General Conference uh, leadership says, hey, uh, we don't believe in that. And they just sent all their leaders over there. And then I think Elder Wilson, our, our GC president, was in Prague. Uh, there was others in Poland and in some place, some people in Ukraine while the war is going on next door. And there's some amazing stories going on. And you can go to AdventistReview.org to find those stories. <laughs> Amen? Anyway, just a shameless little plug. Do you have your Bibles here tonight? Yes. If you have your Bible, please, please turn on your Bibles or open your Bibles. And today we're going to do a Bible study. So appreciated the, the special music of Thy Word. If you have your Bibles, and you shouldn't, you should, I shouldn't say if, this is Georgia Cumberland Conference Camp Meeting, you should have your Bible, amen? amen? And if you don't, just look over the person next to you, and if they are falling asleep, the Lord has anatomically created your elbow to be the sharpest bone of your body. And so if your spouse 
is, is just nodding to the sermon a little more aggressively than, is, than is, is expected. Just give them a nice jab to wake them up, and the Holy Spirit will bless you indeed. If, you're, if your Bible's turn to Luke chapter 13, Luke chapter 13, and before we read from Scripture, I ask that you bow your heads with me one more time here tonight. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we so ask for the pouring of your Holy Spirit. You have appointed camp meetings, large conventions, convocations to be the means by which you send forth your Holy Spirit. And I believe that every person in this humble house is expecting large blessings from you. So beyond the speaker, beyond the title, beyond where we are in history, beyond the leaders, beyond all the the tech and the screens and all the the whatnot, we ask for a contact point with Scripture here tonight, made only possible by your Holy Spirit. This we pray humbly in Jesus' name. Let everyone say. Luke chapter 13, verse 1. If you're there, please say amen. If you're not there, please hurry up. Chapter 13 is after chapter 12 in most translations. Verse 1, the Bible says, There were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all Galileans because they suffered such things. I tell you, nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Every generation has one iconic news breaking, a breaking news event. Some of you totally remember the assassination of JFK. If you do, please raise your hand. That is a generation news making event. Others would say, maybe those who are older would remember the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Other generations would say, I remember when the Berlin Wall fell in the late 80s. Others, the end of communism in Europe. Some others who are younger would say, I remember as 9-11 being the defining event of my generation. And for those who are much younger would say, the pandemic is the uh, the generation defining event. After all these global events, we have become addicted to breaking news. Whether you listen to and watch CNN or Fox News or MSNBC or whatever your, your news, Chattanooga Times, Free Press, we all have now ADHD. Do you know what I'm talking about? It used to be a long time ago, there was just this one person on the screen, yeah? You had an anchor, and then you said, this breaking news, this just happened. But now you have four screens. You got one person here, you got the person they're talking, you got a correspondent here, you got the a scene going on, and then there's like tickers on the bottom and numbers going everywhere, and you just don't know where to look at. Just the other day, I got on my phone breaking news of some, some insignificant actor who's 85 years old, has now given birth, not he, he impregnated his girlfriend's 27 year old. This is not breaking news, friends, amen? But this is the society that we are now living in. We are, just this morning, we heard about a North Korean missile, the debt ceiling reaching a deal, and this is breaking news. And the question is, how did Jesus deal with breaking news? How should his disciples in the 21st century react to the news and to the suffering that's happening around us? And this is what Luke chapter 13 is about. In verse 1, you see that at, at that season, some of them that told of the Galileans whose blood Pilate mingled with their sacrifices. Here was a geo-religio-political affair where the reigning Roman government under Pilate massacred some national, civi- uh, national civilians of Galilee while during, during their visit to the temple. One side advocated for law and order while the other pushed for equality and justice. This could be e- uh, easily ripped from our today's headlines. Do you all remember in 2021 when the Capitol building was, 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 was attacked? Remember where, where the, the Ukraine war was coming out, impending nuclear war was happening, the Cold War coming up again. This could easily be Gal- Galilean Lives Matter movement or pilots making Rome great again. How would Jesus use this political u- this news? 
How would our Lord respond today? And too often, we create Jesus in our own image with our own political bent. But Jesus often uses the circumstances around us to shock us into a deeper spiritual reality. Were these victims more sinful than all the other people there? The obvious answer is no. And Jesus continues in verse 4 and 5, continuing on. Those 18 upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them, do you think that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, nay, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. The second breaking news event was a tower that had fell, resulting in 18 casualties. Whether it be the apartment buildings or skyscrapers, earthquakes, tsunamis, natural or man-made disasters, they leave behind disastrous results. Even today in Davenport, Iowa, you heard the news about the building that fell. In Surfside, Florida, 2021, 98 people died. In 9-11, 2,996 people died in the Twin Towers. Question, were those people who died in the Twin Towers, were they more sinful than all the other people in New York City that God allowed them to die? The answer is no. Why do natural disasters kill so many? Is it because they were worse sinners? Were the 9-11 survivors more righteous than those who had died? Were the people who died of COVID-19 worse sinners than the rest of us? What do these disasters mean? And what I'm getting at is this. It is a temptation to think this. Some in the developed world have a mindset that argues God is blessing me because I must be righteous to some degree. The developing world, poor Africa and those parts in Asia and South America, they must have some kind of innate cultural fault or sin or weakness that causes them to not receive the blessings from God. You might think yourself as too sophisticated for this kind of thinking, but how many times have you seen the reflex-like thinking that God causes suffering for sin? That God causes because of a direct sin that you've done. This happens to me. How many of you have ever lost your keys or your phone? You know what I'm talking about? And we know, we know for sure from Sabbath school and from camp that God is not a capricious God. But there's something carnal in our hearts that, you know, whenever you, one time I lost my keys and my keys were in my refrigerator. I don't know how they got there, but they got there. But I was looking for my keys. I was looking, 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 looking. And then you get into stage two. Be rational, Justin. It's got to be here somewhere. And don't you love it, gentlemen, when your spouse says, when they ask the question, where did you see your keys last? Well, if I knew that, then I'd not be looking for my keys. <laughs> anyway, here you're looking for my keys. Rational, 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 rational. They've got to be here somewhere. You looked everywhere. Your rationale ends, and now your emotions have kicked in. And now you're getting suspicious. And I see my neighbor walking the dog in front of our house, and I start thinking, my neighbor broke into my house, stole my keys, and is pretending like he's walking his dog. I become totally irrational. Then you start panicking. Yes or no? And if you're laughing, you're laughing because this happened to you. <laughs> there's, there's, there's times where you get on your knees and, Lord, help me to find my keys. And does the Lord, does he answer prayers like this? Of course he does. He cares for these small things. And he, cares, he knows how many uh, hairs or, or no hairs that you have on your head. But there's a, there's a pagan temptation to think, Lord, is it because I did something bad that you caused this minor suffering to happen in my life? There are obvious repercussions for sin, for sure, and for our wrong decisions. But what about unconnected incidents? One time my mother-in-law, she came to me and she asked me this question. They were, they were making smoothies or something on Sabbath, and she was using a Vitamix. How many of you have a Vitamix? You love your Vitamix, Adventist. You are a good Adventist if you have Vitamix. And you have Vitamix, and then they were making a smoothie on Sabbath, and accidentally my father-in-law, he, he was cleaning it, and, and, and then he just kind of nicked his finger, and the tip of his finger just fell off. Right, it's a totally disgusting story. I'm sorry, but uh, and then he he was he was he got it healed, and he's he's doing great. He's got all ten fingers and whatnot. But my mother-in-law was thinking, I can't buy help. Why did God allow this to happen? Is it because 
we were doing the dishes on Sabbath? That he was angry? I know that's not true, but could it be? Do you understand the temptation to think that way? As foolish as it is, there is that pagan tendency. This kind of thinking occurred in biblical times also. Upon the death of the son, of her son, the widow in 1 Kings 17, 18, accused God of remembering her sins and punishing her for them. Such assumptions are based on paganism, that the gods are angry, petty, and in need of appeasement. However, Matthew 5, 5, 45 says, God makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. What then should be our reaction to the suffering of others and to the news of disasters? Perhaps we should end our addiction to doom scrolling and looking at the news and follow Jesus to a deeper truth. Note that Jesus transitioned from this discussion of the slain Galileans and the disaster of Siloam into a parable. And this interesting parable has no ending. The implication is that the readers must determine its conclusion. Here's, here we go. Luke chapter 13, verse 6. 13, verse 6 is set in a vineyard with a fig tree. The fig tree is prolific and useful. It produces fruits seven times a year. The fig tree is a humble tree. It's not ostentatious. It has no flowers and only has leaves. It's a modest tree, if you will. The fig tree also tells time. It preaches the signs of the times. It is a good Seventh-day Adventist tree. It is a, the fig is a perfect health food. Did you know that if you take one fig fruit, a little little. Uh, fresh one. We don't have fresh ones in here in North America because through shipping they, they get damaged. But it has enough nutrients to nourish you for one day. And they call it the poor man's fruit. You'll still be hungry, but you have enough nutrients to sustain you for one day. The fig was a symbol of Israel according to Joel 2 and Matthew 21. Interestingly, this farmer decides to plant a fig tree in the midst of a vineyard. The great question is why? How many of you during the pandemic, and maybe this is, this is Tennessee, so maybe you all have gardens in your back, backyard, but how many of you decided to plant a, a garden during the pandemic? You wanted to go all organic, you went to Lowe's and Home Depot or Tractor Home Supply, and you just got, you went all out. You spent a million dollars on your garden, but you only grew two tomatoes during the whole pandemic. <laughs> That's what happened to us. This guy, he plants a fig tree in the midst of a vineyard. Question, what do you grow in a vineyard? Grapes. Then why do you plant a fig tree in there? It doesn't make sense. It's like saying, hey, come over. I want you to see my tomatoes. In the middle of the tomatoes, there's a cucumber plant. Why is there a cucumber plant there? Have you asked yourself? Figs and grape vineyards are often mentioned together in the Bible. Deuteronomy 8, Micah 4, 1 Kings 4, Zechariah 3. The exact agricultural relationship between figs and grapes is unknown, but the two have some benefit to each other. Either one provides shade for the vines, or there's a predatorial deterrent. The, figs, uh, the birds go for the figs instead of the grapes. Or there's a potential nutritional symbiosis or there's an aesthetic complementarity, or some mixture of all of the above, but there's a relationship that figs and grapes, they work together. It is clear that Israel was the fig tree and had a special function and a purpose to be a blessing to the vineyard of all the nations around it. However, instead of being a blessing, the tree sucked out all the nutrients, and it did not provide fruit. Verse 10, uh, verse 6, sorry. Verse 6. He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. He came and sought fruit thereon and found none. He found nothing. Israel was receiving the blessings of God, but did not bless the nations around it, and it forgot its original purpose, identity, design, and function. Do you know instances where those who have forgotten their purpose because of the affluence and the blessings around them? Rather than being suns that give forth light, they've reverted and become black holes 
that suck even the light that passes within its their vicinity. Rather than expanding his kingdom, they go to camp meetings under the theme of shrinking his kingdom. These are medical students, medical school students, who want to be overseas missionaries, only to be sucked into prosperity, exacerbated by their need to pay off their school loans, that they forget their original purpose of missionary work and establish comfortable practices instead. No fruit. These are immigrants who come to America to get education for themselves and their children and perhaps help their family back home, but they forget their purpose and their their identity and they end up playing keeping up with the Joneses instead. No fruit. These are students who go to Southern University to become successful professionals, only to forget their purpose and their avenous identity and the sacrifice of their parents and their professors, and they get involved with the wrong crowd, and they end up with wrong substances, wrong liquids in their body, and they have no fruit. These are parents who intended to raise godly children, but work, finances, Bills, stress, streaming entertainment get in the way and they lose sight of God's original design for families and they raise children half-heartedly and they barely raise them over the finish line at 18 years old. No fruit. These are ministers who go into ministry to save souls but they forget their calling. They get involved in organizational politics and they play games and they lose their calling to cynicism, bitterness, and contempt. No fruit. These are retirees who started their lives strong with faith. They lived lives of stewardship and sacrifice, but they ended their careers with questionable practices. They lost their integrity to ensure that their retirement years were secure and comfortable. No fruit. The same question could be asked of church organizations and institutions today whether we have been merely receiving the blessings of God or if we are reciprocating those blessings back to the vineyard, to the communities and the campuses and the circles around us that are not Seventh-day Adventist. The church has a family message, but are our marriages and our families, are are they a blessing to those families around us? We have a health message. We got hospitals and health educators and nutritionists But are we truly healing the vineyards we're planted in, or are they merely our patients and our clients for our paychecks? We have an educational message with wonderful schools, churches. We have a mission work with community centers and centers of influence. But are we merely serving them with, are we serving them with God's glory in mind, or are we merely absorbing tuition from them to sustain our salaries and our systems? Another phrase to explain all this It's called mission drift. It's mission what, everyone? Mission drift. There once was an organization called Pew Charitable Trusts. This group used to fundraise for Billy Graham. They started a magazine called Christianity Today. But they lost their mission focus. They drifted. And now, when you watch PBS or any uh, uh, public television, They're the ones sponsoring public television programs. You have Bible translation organizations that used to be all about getting out into as many languages as possible. They've lost their mission and they've drifted into becoming international, secular, UN document translation companies. Have you heard of the Ivy League universities? Yale, Harvard, Dartmouth, Columbia, Princeton, and Brown. This is the American elite schools. Today, they are known as the best schools in the world, but they started as seminaries for young people. Get this. Listen very carefully. This was in the, in the Yale's handbook. Yale. Yale College. Yale University. Seeing that God is the giver of all wisdom, every student, besides his private and secret prayer, will be present morning and evening for public prayer. Princeton University Cursed is all learning that is contrary to the cross of Christ. Harvard's original purpose, to be plainly instructed and consider well that the main goal of your life and your studies is to know God and Jesus Christ. Harvard University. 
Harvard University used to have two books pointed upward, meaning we can absorb this knowledge. But there is one book that was facing downward, meaning there is a limit to human knowledge, and after that is divine knowledge. Through Mission Drift, Harvard even changed their logo, where now all three books are facing up, meaning there is no limit to the human mind. In Harvard's uh, handbook, it says, everyone shall so exercise himself in reading the scriptures twice a day that he shall be able to give an account of his proficiency therein. And their motto was Veritas Christo Ecclesiae, which means truth for Christ and the church, 1692. But through mission drift, they cut their motto, and now it is just Veritas, which is just truth in general. This gardener looks for fruit, and he finds no fruit thereon. What is the fruit that Jesus looks for? In John 15, 16, he is looking for souls for the kingdom. This is fruit that Jesus is looking for. According to Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, he is looking for characteristics of Jesus. The character of Jesus. And interestingly, these are the only two things we can bring to heaven. Amen? Souls to the kingdom and the characteristic, the character of Jesus. On a real local level, let's, get, let's be real straight. The Lord has given us land and mortgages and blessings and the, the houses that we have are not for our dwelling places, but mere headquarters for local evangelism on the neighborhood level. When we buy and sell land, we're not looking for profitability and best interest rate, we're looking at evangelistic potential. We, 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 uh, I tell students, when you, look, when you choose for uh, classes and majors, you're not looking for the, the hottest girl or the hottest guy or the, or the, the major that, that, that is the, the, the most popular and will get you the most money. You, look, you choose the professors and the classes for evangelistic potential. We enter schools, we get jobs, we get married, we, get, we retire for two purposes, to win souls and to have the character of Jesus. This is the fruit that Jesus is looking for. Any other goal, Jesus finds no fruit, and we're just sucking the blessings that God is giving to us. Verse 7, are you still with me? Verse 7, then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? While fruit may not appear the first year, subsequent years should see some harvest. The mention of three years in the parable causes us to ask, how did you spend your last three years? How did you all spend your last three years during the pandemic? Isaac Newton, during the bubonic plague, he discovered gravity. What did you do? He wrote on optics and calculus, and he called it the most remarkable year of his career. What did you do? Nothing. Shakespeare, during one of his, one of the pandemics during his times, he wrote King Lear, Macbeth, and Anthony and Cleopatra. Mary Shelley, not a quarantine, but during a volcanic isolation where everything was shut down, she wrote Frankenstein. What did you do? We, as Christians and followers of Jesus, we don't discover scientific theories per se. We don't write novels, and please don't write the next Frankenstein. But as disciples of Jesus, what we do, what, should, what we should be known as, are the people who find souls, who win souls, and have the character of Jesus. Verse 8, Jesus answered, uh, and he, sa he answered and said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, until I shall dig around it, about it, and dung it. I love the King James that says, dung it. The modern translations say, fertilize it. Something about fertilizer that just takes away the, the aroma of dung. Verse 9, if it bear fruit, good. 
But if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. The discouraged owner ordered the felling of the fig tree. And at that moment, a gardener intercedes for one more year of mercy. Two courses of treatment are described, digging and fertilizing, or dunging. Years of an inactivity, years of bitterness, years of indifference lead to hard soil. And I, I, you'll have to forgive me. Many of you are very well experienced gardeners. I have no idea about gardening whatsoever. But apparently there is this uh, accoutrement called the claw. Have you heard of the claw? You go to Home and Depot, that's where I go, or, or Lowe's, you find this thing. And then sometimes the soil is so compacted that no matter what kind of nutrition you put on top, no matter how much water you put on top, it cannot penetrate that compacted soil. So you got to get the thing, the thing called the claw, and you got to stab it into the ground and twist, stab, twist, stab, twist. And what happens is that the ground, the soil, becomes nice and, I don't know what the word is, but it's, it looks like this. <laughs> yes, yes or no? It looks, it looks like it's, it's just wonderful. But it has no nutrition in it. And so here, this guy doesn't go to Home Depot that's in some kind of you know, nice packaged fertilizer. In some parts of the world, and even in the United States, fertilizer is dung. What is dung? I don't know what you're saying, but I agree with you. It is the, the leftover remnants of animals, yes? Yes? It smells. It is not pleasant. But in the hands of a master gardener who knows what he's doing, it's exactly what that soil needs. Because of the impacted soil, nutrients and water can now penetrate into the soil because of the claw. Skilled digging is necessary to break apart the soil, but not damage the soil too much. Dung. I gotta, I gotta share the story. I'm sorry, I am North American, born, and I love toilets. I grew up, in, I was born in New York, born with toilets, trained to use a toilet, and as I grew up and I became seven, eight, nine, 12, 13, I forget how old I was, my parents decided we need to send this child to Korea. He needs to learn the language, to learn his roots, to learn about that he's, uh, he's a Korean also. So I went to Korea and no, they didn't send me to my uncle that lived in the city. They sent me into my other uncle that lived in the middle of nowhere. And we went into the Jeep, and we were just, you know, bumping along in this car. We went in the middle, just up the hill, down the hill, up the mountain, down the hill, through the woods, to Grandma's house we go. I mean, it was just in the middle of nowhere. And we ended up on this hillside, beautiful, pristine place in the 1980s. You go to Korea today, South Korea is one of the most industrialized, developed, technologically advanced countries in the world. But back in the 80s, it was just starting out. And I remember just seeing all the trees and, and there was no electricity, there was no running water, there was nothing. And I remember, hey uncle, I see that you got a bedroom, I see that you got a kitchen, I see that you got a living room, where's the bathroom? And he said, my nephew, come here. Look out into the distance. And see over there. And I saw, and in the distance, there was a pink curtain. And in a circus, an outhouse with a pink curtain all around it. That is the bathroom. It's like, oh. The, the naivete that I had, I went to this bathroom and I had to go. And, and I'm sorry if you have a weak stomach, but I got to tell this story because it's part of the sermon. <laughs> I opened the curtain and there was a hole. That was the toilet. How many of you are familiar, maybe from your missionary experience, or from your agricultural background, or your childhood, of this kind of experience? Well, praise the Lord, I'm, 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 in, I'm in similar, so you know what I'm talking about. 
There was a hole. And there were two wooden planks over the hole. One plank for your right foot, one plank for your left foot. And you gotta do your thing. And one miscalculation, <laughs> one wrong angle, one wrong calculation, no, what just, it would result in death. <laughs> and I remember going there and looking down. I mean, there were demons inside there. This was the abyss. And you do your thing, okay? I'm not gonna talk about it, you do your thing. And I remember that summer, that summer, I refused to eat solids. I refused. So that my uncle and aunt had to call, I had to do a long distance call to my mother and saying, hey, why isn't your, your son eating? And then it's, I don't wanna use the bathroom. I mean, that's just a whole dramatic another story. Fast forward to the end. I remember my aunt, she goes out one day and she takes out gloves not gloves to your wrist, but gloves all the way out to your shoulders. And you gotta realize, people who live in the middle of nowhere utilize everything. Everything. What did I say? <laughs> everything. So she's going out to the outhouse and the little annoying nephew that I was, hey, auntie, what are you doing? Oh, no, you wanna stay inside. No, no, I wanna follow. What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? I'm following her out. And she goes out, she pulls the curtain aside, and there's stairs there, and there's this wooden door, and she opens this door contraption, and then she has access into the depths of the abyss. And she pulls the abyss out, and it's this big pink tub. And I don't know why, but the curtain is pink, the tub is pink, and her gloves are pink. And to this day, I have trauma because of that color pink. And she's pulling this out, and she dumped it all out, and I'm like, what are you doing? And there's all these demons and monsters in there. And she's throwing chemicals in there. She throws hay in there, more chemicals, more dirt. And she's mixing this thing around like some Shakespearean witch in Macbeth. She's mixing, 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 mixing. And I'm like, I'm not staying here for this. That is, that is just disgusting. That is disgusting. About the last week of the summer, my aunt is cooking zucchini, and I'm eating it. And it's in the Korean way where you slice it, you put in some little bit of egg and some, some flour. I think you call it, you, you drudge it, dredge it, dunk it. I don't know what you call it. You do something to it. It's really good. She's cooking it. Hey, this is really good, auntie. Where'd you get the zucchini? Because we haven't been to the market for months now. Oh, I grew it over there. Hey, but over there, that was that patch of land that was really bad. Oh, I made it good. How'd you make it good? Oh, I'm a really good gardener. Oh, well, tell it, because, because we got land in America, and I want to know how to make the land there good, too. Oh, hey, remember when I went to the outhouse? Uh-huh. Remember when I took the, uh-huh, uh-huh? Well, I used that for that land. And that's where the zucchini came out super bright and fresh and it was awesome and it was a good harv uh, fruitful harvest. And that's what you're eating right now. <laughs> and so I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, to this day, 30 years later, I still have a hard time eating zucchini. <laughs> very hard time. Now I'm using a very visceral and a visual and a maybe even a smelly anecdote to show you that under the hands of a master gardener, she knew what she was doing. She was digging around that land and she was using not something wonderfully smelling, she used some messy stuff. But she knew, she knew how to use it in what proportion and in what manner she was a master gardener. If she's a master gardener for that plot of land, how much more is our Lord Jesus a master gardener for our hearts? Amen. And he wants to dig around your heart. And he knows exactly how much to dig. He won't dig around there more than he needs to. But he needs to pierce through that heart where nutrition can't get through. Amen? Amen. Not only does he dig, he gives us the horrible digging experiences because we need it. Sometimes you all know we need some of these experiences, amen? 
And on top of that, he gives us dunging experiences. Dunging experiences in your family, in your marriage, in your local church, in your local conference, in the United States, wherever. And in the hands of a master gardener, not to punish you, amen, but to get us to get fruit for the Lord Jesus. Souls for the kingdom. That sometimes we get so insular, so comfortable, that we're like, eh, that's for the pastor to do. That's not for me to do. And we think of the character of Jesus. That for, that's optional. That's fruity, willy-stilly stuff. That, 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 that's what Christians do, but I'm, I don't, I don't want to do that stuff. The Lord gives us these experiences so that we become fruitful. If it bears fruit, good. If it doesn't bear fruit, then a master gardener cannot work with this ground anymore. How many of you want to say, Lord, I want to bear fruit. I, I want to bear, now you raise your hand. You, you, do you know what you just did? Do you know what you just did? Now when you raise hands in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, do you know why you're raising your hands? Do you know why you're doing this? You're not doing it for the preacher. You're not doing it for the cameras. Do you know why? Who, who is this hand for? The Lord is all knowing. He doesn't need to know. He doesn't need to see. He already reads your hearts. Why do we do, why do, we do the hand thing in the Adventist church? Why? In this great controversy that we're living in, who is witnessing our lives? It's the angels. It's the unfallen worlds. It's all the, the Martians and the Ewoks and the Vulcans and I don't know what other people's out there. The Lord hasn't revealed that to us yet. But all those unfallen worlds, they're looking down and they see Justin Kim? How can he come? What? But then he sees Justin Kim raising his hand at George the Cumberland Camping and say, Lord, I need help. And the focus is off of Justin. Now the angels are going to look to Jesus, the master gardener, to see what he does in G. Justin's heart. Does it make sense? So I ask you one more time. How many of you want to say, Lord, I want more fruit in my life. Please dig around me. Please dung me. Two hands. You are a funny people. I use a funny illustration to let, to let it remain in our hearts how serious this is. Let's expand the kingdom for God's glory, shall we? Let's pray together. Gracious Father, Lord, our hearts are so deceptive. Our, our hearts are so selfish. We are so comfortable in doing nothing. And so, Father, sometimes we need a, we need a, a kick in our pants, but we, we rely on your love and your gentleness but also in your wisdom and in your justice. Lord, we want to be fruitful for the kingdom. We want to please you, Master. So, Father, we ask that you help us grow out of our inwardness and our selfishness. And may this, this, this camp meeting a theme, may it not be a theme that we, we plaster on the front of a program. May this be a sincere prayer of our hearts. Help us to expand your kingdom. Open our eyes, have, help us to have mercy on our neighbors all around us, to pray for our non-Adventist brothers and sisters, and also some of our Adventist brothers and sisters who need those prayers too. Lord, dig around our hearts, and we pray that you do so in, in, a, in a very surgically precise way, in a way that's needed and no more than that, that we receive the blessings of heaven to be agents for heaven. Lord, bless each one in this room who has risen their hands. Lord, may the angels witness. And Father, our attention is now to you and to your Holy Spirit and the Son who reigns in heaven. Bless us and bless this conference in a special way, we pray in Jesus' name. Let everyone say.